All right. So, um, yeah. So welcome back, guys. <laughs> uh, it's been a week, I guess. Uh, hopefully you guys have been busy. Um, or maybe not too busy, but like enough to help you guys catch up. Um, so again, this is section five. So that means we're going to talk about a lot about SQL. And a big reason why we're uh, doing SQL is for data scientists, we need data. And not just a lot of times when we're actually getting um, our data, we're usually talking to a business or some organization, and that data tends to be in a SQL server. Um, it's not always put in that way, but SQL has been around, I think, from since the 1970s is when it was first kind of created, um, and then it's kind of gained popularity. So uh, if you are familiar with data analytics, um, you probably have worked with SQL. Um, there's a lot of people who are uh, business analysts uh, who work with SQL. Um, so it's kind of a nice common thread. And in fact, you'll see a lot of things in Pandas right now that's actually based around SQL, like terminology. You'll see like joins and group buys. Um, those things are very similar. Basically, they came from SQL, and it's because kind of um, SQL is kind of like the OG of like, you know, databases. Um, it's, and it's still very common today. Um, I used to work for a credit union and everything was going through SQL. Um, and it's kind of, um, it's kind of a strange thing. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what SQL is, um, but SQL is what we call a command language, which isn't quite the same way we can think of Python. It's basically, without going into for like huge amounts of detail, um, there's huge books that, that you can like read up on like, you know, what exactly SQL is and all the terminology and like all the specifics and efficiencies. Um, but uh, you can think of SQL as a command language, which basically you give it a command and it's executed on the server. And it turns out that depending on what kind of server you're talking to, um, for example, there's DB2, which is from IBM. Um, there's MySQL. There's a recent one right now that's getting, getting a lot of popularity, Postgres SQL. Um, and basically, they're just different structures. And what's kind of nice is that m even though they're different structures, for the most part, you can use the SQL like syntax and pretty much get what you expect. There are some nuances, for example, like how they how they go through the database itself and basically do what you want. Um, there's also sometimes, depending on the um, the structure of the server itself, you might see things that. Um, one type, for example, MySQL might do certain things in a certain way or have a certain function that you can use, but DB2, another kind of SQL server, can't use it. So it's always important to talk to, you know, whatever organization you're talking to when you're querying their database uh, to make sure they have. So I'm kind of giving you like, some broad strokes of like what SQL is and why it's important that we're actually talking about it. Um, and what's kind of nice is that uh, when we have SQL, it means there is data or there are data, right? They're data that you can get to, um, which means you don't have to, you know, quote unquote, mine it um, and web scrape. And um, those are the ones like always like the dirty terms because like we always like we always say like dirty data and like web scraping and scrubbing and stuff like that. The cleaner we can get the data, the faster we can get into um, our predictive modeling, our statistical analysis, all of those good stuff. Um, as I mentioned before, usually when we're doing data, uh, si do, do, uh, doing data science. Uh, the majority of your time, like a good majority, I'd say 70 to 80% of your time is going through data and cleaning it and making sure it's ready to actually do stuff with. Um, it turns out once you do that uh, scrubbing and cleaning, it turns out most of the time, the rest of the stuff is relatively quick. Um, but if we can get that clean data first, it means we don't have to worry about that 70 to 80%. Um, just know that in reality, that's not always true. And even then, you get stuff from a SQL, a SQL server or wherever you're getting it, and it might not be clean. Uh, it might be something that you do have to go through, um, but at least it's one less step removed. Okay. So, um, any questions on SQL so far that I kind of mentioned? Um, again, I'm just doing more broad strokes. Um, real quick, thumbs up, thumbs down for anyone who's had experience maybe with SQL before. Okay, good. I see a, a, a few thumbs up. I saw Rudy, Tara. Um, yeah, it's had some people sideways, thumbs down. That's okay. And some of you guys might have more familiarity with it, which is awesome. Uh, those of you guys who don't, you know. That's okay too. That's why we're here to learn. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. And whenever I do this, you guys will disappear in like half a second. And I have to go find you guys again. All right. So uh, real quick, thumbs up if you can see my screen fine. Oh, wait, I can see you. Okay, good. I see you guys. All right, good. So yeah. So real quick, um, the stuff we're going to talk about right now is in the GitHub resource um, that I I think I shared that out to you guys before. I'll share it to you guys one more time just to make sure you guys have it. Okay. Um, but uh, specifically, we're in mod one. Uh, let's see. Here. 
SQL. And so you can see here, I have a couple of things. This intro to SQL, we'll talk about this. Um, it's basically just us talking about like what SQL is and then using SQL, which is kind of borrowed partly from the curriculum, but we'll kind of do a walkthrough, like a code through going through. All right. So um, I also have a resource that I mentioned before. Um, if you guys remember, uh, Eli had put together one of the other instructors, um, put together a great resource of some material, basically some cheat sheets that are really useful, um, especially SQL if you're like not super familiar with it. Um, it can be useful just to like, use these cheat sheets. So I'm gonna send this through this chat too. Um, and so just note there's, there's a good like number of cheat sheets. We also have, um, he wrote a success recipe um, and some resources too. Um, it's always super useful. Um, and then he also has this key right here, an example of a database. We're not gonna really talk about that, but you're welcome to kind of explore it through. So the first thing I'm gonna show you the sheet that's in here um, in that shared drive, basically some learning objectives. And I think these match pretty well with what we're gonna talk about as well as a recording. Um, this should be in the student resources anyway, but I'm just kind of showing you. Um, there's a recording um, of one of his lessons. So you can actually see a different uh, instructor style. So maybe some stuff I didn't go through or maybe he explains it in a different way that's useful for you. That's good to check out. Um, and then of course these resources. Uh, one thing he always tells me is like, you know, these resources, one, two, three, four, five, six, they're not in any particular order. They're just resources that he found that are useful. And looking through them, they're actually very, um, useful in the sense of like understanding what SQL is and like seeing what, um, how, it's be, how it's used. Okay. Um, so again, pretty common uh, boilerplate stuff that we have normally. And then the different cheat sheets. So um, there's a few of them in here. This one in particular will be really useful for joins. Joins are probably going to be the most uh, like, I think that's the SQL stuff where it can get kind of like, wait, what's going on? Um, so this is useful to kind of look through it. This curriculum does go through joins quite a bit which um, is useful. But again, if you have more questions about it, you know, reach out, uh, reach out to each other. Uh, there's a lot of resources to help explain what joins are. Um, now, one thing to kind of caveat is that um, when we're talking about SQL, we will we'll see that um, I'm more of a Pandas person myself. Um, and there's some benefits for using Pandas because in my mind, it's easier for me to comprehend. It's more Pythonic. You know, I can kind of process it better. Um, some people who are used to SQL will go into SQL and that's totally cool too. Um, there's also benefits for SQL, uh, which we'll talk about in a sense, but like why SQL is important to do over Pandas. But just know you can kind of do the same thing depending what you have. Um, you can do the same stuff in SQL as you can in Pandas, but there's some trade-offs to do. But um, really great cheat sheet here. Um, I would recommend definitely looking over this as you guys go through SQL and the curriculum. Um, he has another cheat sheet right here, which is basically kind of shows you some um, how to deal with some null values, aggregated functions. We'll talk about this briefly. Nested queries, we don't talk about this today, um, but this could be useful basically creating sub um, tables within tables. And um, I think the curriculum talks about this. Normally, um, this is something we don't necessarily do too much in uh, I mean, I should say, as a data scientist, I won't personally do it. I know data scientists who do. Um, SQL can get very, very complicated. Uh, so SQL can also be very short. Um, sometimes you can have like a SQL line, it depends on how you break it up, like, you know, four, maybe 10 lines of code kind of deal. And um, the largest SQL query I've ever done, personally, and to me, this there's even even larger, it's been like 400 lines. And in my mind, it's just like, for SQL at least, I'm like, it it was kind of hard to debug and I just, it was a mess for, in my mind. But again, some people really understand it and they do it really well. So it's all up to you. Um, just know it's another tool set. Um, and then there's some operation stuff. So again, look to that cheat sheet, another cheat sheet too. Um, I'm not as familiar with this one, this particular company right here, this Academy. Um, but again, some of the same, same stuff, just for quick things for you to select things. Once you understand enough SQL, this can be useful. But I think this um, cheat sheet in particular is probably the one that I would go to the most, okay? So cool. Um, so I just want to show you guys that stuff. So we're just going to go right into it. So intro to SQL. Okay, uh, what is a database? So a database, as you guys can probably guess, is holds a bunch of data. Um, you guys probably already know like a little bit of like what databases are. Um, you can kind of get that idea. But you can think of it as like a set of table of data. Um, you can think of like each table as literally like a spreadsheet. That's the way I kind of think of it. Um, they're structured in some way. If you guys um, you know familiar with Excel, also data frames, that's basically what a spreadsheet is, right? It's comparable to like a CSV file, an Excel file. Basically, each table um, has information. Basically, each row, you know, we call it rows. Each rows are um, one single data point, represents one entity. And then each column would represent, you know, what the things are represent uh, or what like um, specific attributes of that row. So again, pretty similar to like a pandas data frame. Okay. 
So this shouldn't be like too hard to understand. But um, the big thing is about the database structure because the database structure can actually have a lot of information in it. So we can have a spreadsheet. Um, if you ever try to open up Excel, like a very, very large spreadsheet, um, depending on your computer, uh, your computer might freeze up when you try to open up this um, Excel spreadsheet. So databases are basically a way, um, especially back in the day when computers had very, very uh, small amounts of memory, you couldn't load everything into memory like Excel does. Um, nowadays, we have like, you know, eight gigabytes of RAM easy. Um, back in the day, we didn't really have that much RAM. So you have to figure out a way to get little by little and SQL allowed you kind of, or databases allowed you to store a bunch of information and then pull that information little by little as you want to, okay? So um, when you talk to a business, you're going to usually ask for something called the schema, or sometimes you'll hear like a database dictionary. Um, basically, your schema is like made of tables, and it shows you a whole bunch of information about that database. And so um, the reason why we have multiple tables, okay, so it can hold multiple things. So sometimes if you ever um, work with someone who's done Excel and someone gets a little too crazy with Excel and doesn't organize it really well, it can get really, really messy. Um, databases can help you, well, databases are very structured, so it's hard to make it messy. You can't have like random columns in there, basically, um, especially for SQL servers, is you have to have specific types. So in this column, if it's gonna be an integer, or if it's gonna be, you know, a float, or if it's gonna be a Boolean, it's only gonna allow those values. It's not gonna let you put whatever you want in there, like Excel would. So this is one reason why databases can be really useful. It's very structured. It means that you have predictability on how to go through it. And that's the reason, that's the reason why we use databases. Um, also, you'll hear this relational database. And relational database means that there are built-in relations. So each table you can kind of think of as like represents something. So for example, these little rectangles right here, these squares, they're representing um, one table. So for example, I have a table of products and I have a table of order details. I have a, a table of orders, right? And so each, each of these tables holds information in this case information about orders, information about customers, information about employees. So that's the kind of idea like how we structure our tables. Um, if you're really curious uh, about structuring this stuff, um, this is closer to data engineering, but um, there's something called tidy data about saying how you should structure, um, the, like basically the philosophy of how you structure your data um, can be really useful. Um, it's kind of suggest looking into that if you're curious about how do you decide what goes in a table and what doesn't go in the table. Um, turns out it's a little more subtle than just saying, oh, whatever seems to fit in there, okay? Um, now, again, schemas are really common businesses. So if you're coming in either um, with a data science team with your own company, you'll probably have some kind of relational database schema. Uh, if you're going into, you know, for another company and giving insights for that company or organization, they likely will have a schema that they can give you or will likely know what you're talking about when you say you have a database schema. Um, usually they'll say, oh, yes, you know, here it is. And this, for example, is a very small one. Um, I think that credit you know used to work for we had about like 400 different tables depending on you know like what we're looking at um i've seen like i've literally seen people have database like this um schema right here literally printed out and against their wall like going from the top of the ceiling to the bottom of the floor of this huge um structure so you can see it can get very complicated um but the good thing is it allows you to understand how to navigate through the database so you can see these lines right here and the curriculum does through a good job of explaining what these like different symbols are. But basically it's just telling you how these tables relate to each other. And this comes actually from something called a primary and foreign key. So basically, and I'll talk about this more in detail, basically every table has to have a primary key. And then a foreign key allows you to relate to saying, hey, how does this table relate to this table? So for example, we can see our products, right? In this uh, case, it has a little star right here. That's the product code, it's their primary key, okay? And it's linked over to product lines. So it turns out, in this case, it looks like product line is their foreign key. Basically, it refers back to this table. This way, you can say, oh, I'm looking at a specific product. Let's say, you know, something like, I don't know, um, deter like some detergent, right? Detergent A. And detergent A has a product code, product name, and if it's a product line, it's like, oh, you can go to that product line table and look up more information, for example, the text description, HTML description, image, all that stuff. Okay, so this allows you again to kind of navigate through the database. Okay, cool. Um, any questions on this so far? Okay. It can look kind of complicated, but um, I think again, the curriculum, especially I think towards the end of the section, gives a good job of like explaining like what these symbols mean. Basically it just means like how they relate to each other. Okay, so I mentioned before primary and foreign keys. Okay, so primary keys basically just means that it's the thing that identifies on that table of saying, this is the thing that's important, or this is the thing that identifies 
each individual row. So it's unique to each data row, okay? It's required for um, most SQL servers and everything like that. And um, it basically, again, it has to be unique, right? So um, if you think of like, uh, let's say I have a table of people, uh, what might be a good, um, if I had to put something in there, like just kind of think of like what you could put down per person, uh, what would likely be a good key, um, a good primary key for a table called persons or per people? Maybe names. Okay, names. So, all right, so this is a tricky one too, right? So it has to be unique. So uh, first of all, first ID? name, probably not a good one. What was that? ID. ID, so I, so maybe ID, for example, maybe it's um, everyone who works at a certain company. Yeah. Um, it could be like their ID. Maybe an email or a phone number. Okay, email, phone number, good phone number and emails are, would be much more specific, right? It's, um, it shouldn't be, I mean, it's possible they have the same phone number, right? Like, but it's much less likely. Um, one thing I didn't mention is that you can, for a lot of times, um, usually we don't do this, but you can use a primary key with as multiple fields. So for example, if you did have something like Giovanna said, like a name, you could possibly use first name, last name. Of course, even then, if there's a lot of John Smiths, you know, in the US, uh, it's gonna be a huge problem, right? So that can be a little issue. Um, like Tara had said, uh, um, you can use, you know, email or something like that. But then if there's a family who shares an email, that could be an issue too. Um, one classic one, um, there's one really big one in the US that we uh, use, which we probably shouldn't use, but to identify Social a person. Social security number. <laughs> Social security number, right? And uh, I'll tell you, working with a finance company, um, you know, a credit union, everything had a social security number. Because it's unique, you know it's that's for that specific person. Almost everyone in the US has one. Um, if you're outside the US, usually there's some kind of like a governmental issued, you know, ID number. Um, I could go into a whole reason why social security numbers are actually really horrible as uh, identification. A um, couple of reasons, just really quickly, because I'm, I'm already talking about it. Um, social security can be really harmful because it's shared amongst so many organizations, which is really useful. But then also if someone steals your social ID or social security number, it's kind of like, well, there's nothing really much you can do. There's not very many things. You can't change your social security number, which is really useful for databasing, but also can be really dangerous in that sense. There's also a few other things. For example, um, there's not security measures put into social security numbers in the sense of like how the numbers work. So you guys know how like when you put in your number for like a credit card and you put in the wrong number, usually like on a website, um, the website goes like, oh, that's an invalid credit card number. You guys ever wonder like, how does it even know that? Um, basically, there's num the numbers themselves can check on itself to see if it's a valid number. Social security doesn't have any like that. Um, there's a whole bunch of things, but I won't go into detail. But yeah, social security usually be a very typical one. Otherwise, you might have multiple um, parts. For example, if you have Giovanna was saying about like your name, maybe it'd be your name, like your first, last name, in email. Of course, so it kind of gets bigger and bigger. So one option is something called a serial, and you'll see this really commonly used in a lot of databases, um, but I don't think the curriculum talks about it too much. A uh, serial basically is just a, just a number, essentially, that just keeps increasing. And so it doesn't really matter what the number represents. It's basically like, you know, kind of what Rudy was saying with an ID. It's kind of like an ID specific to that table. So it like starts off with one, the next person that gets inserted is two, the next person is three, and so on and so on. And that way you know for sure that's always going to be unique because it's always just increasing. And if you remove someone, you just keep counting up, okay? So that's primary keys. And foreign keys, I didn't really go into detail here. Basically, foreign keys are primary keys for another table. So if I wanted to reference, like I said, um, customers, right? Uh, from customers and payments, I would use the customer number from payments to look at customers. So that's kind of like the idea of a foreign key. You're just using it from another table, okay? Any questions on primary or foreign keys in your database? Cool, thumbs up, thumbs down, sideways. All right, cool, good. That was the easy stuff, right? All right, so next we have is our SQL. So basically like what is SQL, right? Well, one way I kind of think of SQL is um, it's kind of like the inter intermediary between like your database and you. So you can think of it like I will write a SQL command um, and I will say, okay, send this off to the server. The server looks at my command and says, oh, this is what you want to do and it'll do the process and then send me the data across, okay? So this is actually where I, um, it can be super useful in that sense that you basically have the server take care of it for you. You don't have to worry about your computer doing any work. Um, now there's some other reasons why we have to worry about, or not worry about, but be considerate of. But I can think of it like, um, it's kind of like a back and forth. It's kind of like your messenger. That's the way I envision it. I don't know if it's the perfect metaphor, um, but I can imagine it being like, hey, like 
you give a message to, let's say, I don't know, let's say you're some business person. This is a metaphor, right? You're some business person. You give it to like, you know, your interns. Hey, you know, I need you to go across town and find out, you know, um, what, you know, ask the business um, how many, you know, employees they have. And so you send the little um, note to with your intern. Your intern just runs across town, asks the business, hey, how many employees do you have? And they say, oh, we have 35. And like, okay. And the person, the intern comes back to you and gives you that information. So in this case, like that, the business you started off with is kind of like you asking for information. You're working on like a Python script. Your messenger is kind of like the SQL command. And then that other business is like this uh, server. So you can kind of think of like things being passed back and forth, back and forth, okay? Versus like the other option, um, which we could do in Pandas is say, you tell the intern say, hey, give me all the papers related to employees. And he goes across the business, asks for, hey, I want all the papers related to the employees. And they get this huge stack of papers and the intern has to like walk across really slowly across town because it's so many papers and they finally get to your place and then you have to sort through them yourself. Um, so this is the idea is like, you know, if you ask for a large amount of information, it can take a long time for that information to go through, especially if you're going through some network. So these are kind of like the advantages, disadvantages, okay? And like I said, it's old school. Um, <laughs> uh, and not, not in a bad way either. Um, it's old school in the sense that it's been around for so long, so you're probably gonna bump into it even if you don't want to. So just kind of give you guys a reason, okay? And so uh, who uses it? data analysts, like I said, business analysts. Um, most organizations, businesses will probably have a SQL server. Note that's not the only way to store data. Um, there's also things, for example, like um, Hadoop and um, Spark, and there's other methods that are not relational databases. Um, an extreme version of this is, oh, I'm gonna mess up the name for it, but basically it's the interstellar, no, interplanetary file system, IPFS, and it's designed to allow you to have, the idea is supposed to be like, oh, if you have, a data storage all the way over in like Neptune. Um, you can access that and not worry about like corruption and stuff like that. Yeah, kind of weird stuff. Um, if you're curious, uh, look it up IPFS. Um, but there's other structures you can have that are not relational databases. Um, and there's some reasons why you would have that. For example, backups or just large amounts of data. Okay. And again, why SQL? I kind of, kind of went through a bunch of this. It's fast as long as the server is fast. It all depends on how quickly the server can process your command. If the server takes a long time to do your command, which in all likelihood, it actually probably is faster than what you could do on your own like local machine, um, then it's good. SQL is very optimized for searching and stuff like that. Now there are certain aspects, certain commands that will take longer on a SQL server than if you did it on a more modern like um, Python or something like that. But it just all depends on the situation. Um, and again, it's super common. Um, and so one kind of caveat for the why um, you would use SQL is that if it basically, if it's gonna take you, for example, if I just wanna know how many employees are over the age of 32, okay? I could get all the employees, like I asked the SQL servers to give me all the employees, to give me all the employees, and then I have to use my computer to sort through it and say who's over 32. If I can instead tell, um, and like let's say there's only like five employees out of like, I'm just make something up, like 3 million, you know, I have to get all the 3 million people, then look at those 3 million people and then look for the five that are under 32. If instead, if I can say, tell the server, say, hey, before you send me any information, just give me information of people who are over or under 32 and they can do all the work and then send you just five, um, like five results. In that case, like it's much smaller. That's an extreme case, but I'm kind of showing like, oh, if it takes more effort for you to sort through it, if you have to get all this information, which can take a long time to transfer over, if you can just get the server to do it, that's why SQL can be really useful. Okay, cool. So that's kind of like my quote, quote unquote, quick, you know, um, overview of like what SQL is, like why we're using SQL and all that stuff. Any questions that um, you guys yeah, have? Yeah, I have yeah. one. Mm -hmm. So that, um, that loading of data with the condition, you, mm -hmm. you, can you do that with pandas or you need the whole data frame? Um, you think a condition like um like like you said i just want the employees under 32 mm -hmm. and then you oh, load yeah. that that information can you do that with pandas too yeah absolutely and it turns out almost everything we could do with sql we can do in pandas it just comes down to are you doing it on your machine or are you making the server do it for you so in that situation you guys can probably think in your head a little bit like oh what would i do if i was given this data 
how to find the employees who are under 32, you could absolutely do this pandas. And to be perfectly honest, that's what I tend to do. Um, to be more honest, it's probably not the best way to do it. But then you need the whole uh, data frame in your computer. Right, and that's the, that's the thing. There's some ways you can get around this, um, but the way Pandas works, um, we'll talk more about this, especially in module three, and saying, okay, we have large data sets. How do we deal with these things? It turns out Pandas, um, if you guys are familiar with computers, uh, computer science, you have to load the full data frame within memory in order to process it. Mm -hmm. So if your data frame is, let's say, 300 gigabytes big, your computer has to fit it within its RAM. So if you don't have 300 gigabytes of RAM available for you, you can't process it through. Um, there's some ways you can go around this. Um, and there's things, for example, there's this um, recent development called, uh, what's it, Mondo's? Oh shoot, Mondo, I think. No, mm. I'm going to mess it up. I'm going to look it up later. But um, there's some ways you can go around this to kind of augment Pandas, but Pandas by itself, you have to load it into memory. And that's one of the disadvantages. Now, what's really nice is that Usually, if you're testing things out, you know, you're not using for very, very large data sets, like maybe you have a 100 gigabyte um, data set, but usually for a data science computer, you might have 100, 128 gigabytes, which is more than enough to process through a lot of this stuff. But if you're doing with very, very large data sets, for example, um, images in particular, um, I worked with a data set that was like almost a terabyte large uh, of just images, and there's no way I could process that completely on my own on my computer. I could maybe try to get a cloud computer, you know, and try to get as much memory as I possibly can, but that's also very expensive. Um, there's ways you can do it basically doing like batch processing or using another framework that's not Pandas, but related to Pandas. So that's the reason why you might do that. Cool, that answer your question, Giovanna? Cool. All right, any other questions? All right, cool. So I'll move on to us actually using SQL, um, which is very similar. I took a lot of this stuff from the curriculum, so know that it'll be, hopefully it'll be kind of familiar if you go through it, um, but also know that it's slightly different too. So um, here's using SQL. So this is the, again, this is on the GitHub repo, so you can check this out yourself. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna use is this, um, we're familiar with NumPy now, right? We're familiar with Pandas, and we have something called SQLite 3, okay? And basically this allows us to make a connection with uh, SQL itself. So the first thing we wanna do is, let's say we have a new database and we're gonna create a new table. We have some data and we wanna input that in, okay? So in this case, we uh, first need to connect to the database, okay? And the way we connect to the database is usually, um, usually you'll see this abbreviation like con or connection, because usually we use it over and over again. We don't wanna give it a super long name. So you usually use things that you use over and over again, you'll tend to see smaller like abbreviations. Um, just know this tends to be convention. Um, if it's not really obvious, uh, the good rule of thumb for Python and just programming in general is make your, um, make your variables descriptive, okay? But since this is convention, we can usually use con like this, just like how we do use pandas with pd, okay? So we basically say sqlite3.connectplanets.db. And so note um, that what this is going on right here, I'm basically saving the connection. So I'm saying, okay, sqlite, make this connection with this database. And in this case, um, there's actually no planets.db. So when I make this connection, it'll actually create this thing called planets.db. And I think someone had done this before. I think it was Thomas um, who had actually tried opening up the planets.db. And you'll see that it, it's not formatted in a way that you can actually look at it. Like you can think of like your CSV. If we did like a read CSV, we can open up the CSV and like look at what the code, like what it is. This database is um, structured in a way where it's optimized for searching through. But it turns out because it's optimized, we also can't open it up and read it through like normal. Um, you can kind of, if you wanted to kind of think of like a metaphor, it's like, oh, it's all in zeros and ones, but we can't read those zeros and ones easily. Um, so that's one reason why you'll get like, if for example, I think Thomas tried to open it up and he got, got an error saying, oh, it's not UTF-8 encoded. Um, basically telling you, it's, like, it's formatted in a different way that's not expecting, so you won't be able to read it. So just know that's what's going on here. Um, again, you're just basically making connection using SQLite 3. Um, note that this is just a file in this case. If this file already existed, uh, this planets.db, it would just start reading from that file or that database. You can also, I kind of put a little note right here, you can also connect it to an external database that's not connected to your network or even on your computer that's running basically a virtual server. Um, it all depends on the system. So for example, Postgres SQL will look something like this where you have Postgres SQL um, user, like username, your secret, which is your password, 
your local host, and then your database name. Um, and that would go all into this part right here with the connection. It all depends on the specific database type, but we're not going to worry about that right now just because um, it's just one extra layer and there's so many different ways. If you are connecting to a server, the best thing to do is probably just Google say, hey, how do I connect to a Postgres SQL server? And you can go find exactly what the formatting is going to be. Um, but real quick, before I move on to what this part is, um, if you do put in your you know, if you are connecting in some way like this, like Postgres SQL, you notice that your, um, your password's in here. Be very, very careful if you're ever doing stuff, especially um, when you have your password. But when you're um, saving things on Git or even GitHub, um, and really just Git in general, because later on your Git, Git could be used in like GitHub or Bitbucket or whatever, um, hard coding your password in the code can be very dangerous. Um, for hopefully you guys can see why. It's like if I put my password literally here, like, oh, secret one, two, three, it's my password, and I save it and then do a git commit and then load it up into GitHub. Well, now everyone can see, you know, especially if it's public, everyone can see my password in that case, right? Um, and let's say I accidentally do that. I'm like, oh, shoot, like I put my password on there and I committed it. All right, let me go ahead and like I, I uh, delete it and then I save it and then do commit and then push it up to GitHub. Am I safe now? Now I see some headshakes and good, because the reason why is because remember Git in GitHub, or I should say Git, is a version control system, which means it keeps all the history of the things you've done. So my suggestion, if this ever happens to you, because you know it might, um, <laughs> is that uh, if you do do this, uh, the first thing you should do is um, there's ways to like reformat called rebasing to make sure those commits no longer show up. And this is more advanced stuff I'm not gonna get into right now. And there's ways to do it, but my suggestion is if this ever happens to you in the moment, just go ahead and like make your, you know, for example, make uh, your GitHub profile pr uh, private or delete the repo, keep the local somewhere else. Basically get it off the internet as quick as possible um, because I'll tell you right now, there are definite, pe there's definitely people who crawl through, or, you know, basically bots um, they're basically data scraping, you know, maybe other data scientists that will crawl through and look for passwords or things that are formatted like passwords. Um, so you don't want to keep it in there in any, uh, in any form. So just be aware of that kind of stuff. Um, if you're curious about how to do this, we can talk about it. But usually what you do, you keep a separate key file that you can do. Again, that was my little side note, but it's an important one that um, if you ever come across, it's really important because you don't, you don't want to be the person, you don't want to be patient zero of a data breach, right? That's never a, a fun place to be. Okay, so anyway, you make your connection to your database, okay? And then right here, you'll see that I saved it as con. That's basically saving it as this thing called the connection. Like, I have this connection right here. It's kind of like I've made my intern. My intern now I'm holding in my hand. It's like, all right, cool, I got him. So now I have this intern, con, connection, right? And I'm basically doing this call called cursor. And basically what this allows me to say is, I don't know the good metaphor for this, but I'm almost thinking like giving the intern, giving her like a piece of paper or giving him a piece of paper, right? And saying, all right, you're gonna write this stuff down. And that's kind of what your cursor is kind of doing. It's not the best metaphor, it's not exact, but essentially what you're doing, you're getting prepared to say, all right, connection, I'm gonna give you some commands and you're gonna do these commands for me, okay? So that's why we're doing this cursor right here, right? So now that we made our connection to the database, we actually have to do something with it, right? So in this case, my database is empty. Oh, let me go ahead and run this so I can actually perform the execution. So um, I want to create my planets table. So I'm going to create a data table called planets. And you'll see here, this is our first actual SQL command here. Um, and basically do that cursor. Remember my little like intern, okay? And I'm saying, all right, you're going to execute this stuff. And execute meaning that you're going to perform this stuff. So you can think of like your cursor is like your little messenger person. The connection is kind of like the street they're traveling over to. And they're going over to the database, in this case, planets.db. So in this database, I'm going to create a table pretty simple, right? Create a table called planets. And then I'm going to define in this um, table right here, I'm going to define these different values, like what they should be. And so basically you can think of this ID, this name, this color, num, num of moons, basically number of moons, okay? Um, this thing right here, these are like its variables of the data table, okay? So, and then you'll see this go, cool. okay, cool, Victor. I see there's variables here, but what is this? Integer, tax, tax, integer, real. These are the different types that you can have in your database. So no for SQL um, or for SQLite 3, we can have integer, we can have text, okay? Those are pretty self-explanatory, hopefully. We can have real. Uh, real basically is um, something that's not an integer, but you, a real number, right? It's just another number. There's also something called a blob, but the curriculum does mention, which blob basically is binary data. 
Um, so you can put things like, for example, pictures that are formatted to binary. We're not going to talk about that too much, but just know there's a fourth option you can do. If you're curious, you can look it up, right? So anyway, I'm basically saying, okay, I'm going to have an ID, I'm going to have a name, a color, number of moons, mass, five different columns. And then each of those columns have specific, um, what's it called? Specific types, integer, text, and so on. And note that I have this thing, primary key. I'm just saying, hey, the ID, pretty obvious, should be its primary key, right? So again, that's how I create this table. So if I run this now, it'll tell my cursor, go ahead and execute this thing. And you'll actually see that um, it'll return this guy right here. We'll talk about this actually in next section, in section six. Um, but basically, if you kind of want to look ahead, this is an object. Basically, it's returning an object saying, okay, it's been executed, it's all set. And this will be important when we actually want to get results, okay? But right now, we're just giving the um, database something. So cool, I added, um, I created a new table basically. I created a new spreadsheet with those different columns. Awesome. So now I can go ahead and add even a new column. So that, oh shoot, I forgot to add rings. Like I wanted to put rings in there. I can actually alter the table, planets, and then, so alter the table called planets, add a column, right, called rings, and then set that to a Boolean type. Oh, I forgot Boolean. Boolean is one of the other uh, types you can use, okay? So just know that you can do this. And note that, um, again, when you read the curriculum, you'll probably go into more details. There's a lot you can do with uh, SQL. Um, but one thing you should note is that you'll notice that I had a spaces here, the new lines, and I didn't have spaces here. Uh, SQL does not care about white space. Compared to Python, Python is very you know, fragile and finicky. It's like, oh, no, you didn't have the right amount of uh, white space. You didn't tab correctly. SQL is like, ah, I got it. I can figure it out. So just know that um, you'll see it formatted in different ways. I'll tend to format it in this way, just because in my mind that is structured really well. Um, but know that a lot of times for small little SQL commands, you'll see it written out like this too. Okay, so cool. Um, and I'll run that, so I add a new column there. and said, cool, I got a new table. So I have it all set up. Now I actually put some stuff in there. So I'm just gonna quickly go through this part. Um, but basically I'm just inserting information into the uh, planets table. And you can say I'm putting it into name, color, number of moons, mass, rings. Note that I left out rings. I could have put, I'm sorry, what did I leave out? I left out something, right? Oh, I left out ID. Um, in this case, ID is just like, oh, it's gonna figure it out for me. Basically, I don't have to worry about it. Um, I could have also taken out color or take, only put certain columns in there. That's what, but I'm specifying saying, this is the order of columns I'm gonna put it in. And you can see I have mercury, color is gray. This isn't my database just for the record, um, but we're going to go with it. Number of moons, its mass. In this case, it's probably like a um, uh, Earth mass unit kind of deal. And then rings, okay? So I run this now, and you can see that I have all this information. So I should now have nine planets. I don't know why Pluto's in there. Pluto's not a planet, but we'll play with it for now. We'll give him a, his little shining uh, ability right now. So uh, we insert it in there. Cool. Awesome, right? So now we can actually create a new table now, too. So I'm showing you in that same database, I create a similar exoplanets. And I'll run this pretty quickly. I created my new database. I added a rings column just for the heck of it. Um, note that I also added a star um, um, column in this case, just for this specific one. I just wanted to show something different. Um, and I'm actually going to put a value in for star. So in that case, I get Cygna, Phi. I just made these up, Cygnus, right? So you can see these are probably related to the same star. So now I run this. Like, cool. I now have a planets database or planets table an exoplanets table within my database. So cool. So you can imagine like, all right, I insert new information. This can be really useful. But a lot of times you also have just all the information already in the database. So now I want to actually explore this database. Let's say I made this new thing and now I pass it on to, you know, Andrew, for example. And Andrew goes, okay, well, cool. Let me go to explore this database. Let me see what's in there. So this is a really useful little um, command that you can use for the database. And basically this allows you to see, hey, hey what tables are in here? So you'll see I have that cursor you know, like I had before, my little intern, right? I said, hey, can you go ahead and execute this command for me? And this will execute that whole command right here. And you'll see, ah, there's this new thing, this dot fetch all. And so one thing you'll notice, if I just take this part off, it doesn't give me, it's like, well, that's cool, but that doesn't help me like at all, right? So what it turns out in SQLite uh, 3, um, basically you have this information here, this results, but I actually want to get those results in a readable form. And this is what dot fetch all is. So you can see right here, and there's more subtlety than what that shawl really is doing, but basically you can think of it as like, you actually get to see what those results are. So in this case, it gives me a list of the tables, okay? And note that um, in Python, and Python speak, when we have this, uh, these parentheses like this, this is a tuple, right? But because we want to make it clear in Python, saying, hey, this is a tuple, not just parentheses, like we're doing math, there's always this little extra comment at the end saying, hey, this is a tuple, 
so it knows that it's not just parentheses, it's actually a tuple itself. So this is a list of tuples, okay? In this case, planets and exoplanets. Cool, so we know what tables are in there. Hey, Victor, just really quick basic question. Um, so the text that shows up in black is our Python commands, and then we use the quote marks to indicate we're starting a SQL command, and then right. they appear in red for SQL, right? Right, well, um, you're absolutely right. Um, the, it's not specifically SQL, it's actually a string. So I could have like put oh, in like, yeah, okay. even if I put junk in like this, that's not a SQL yeah. command, but if I do this, it'll say, whoa, I don't know what that is. And it's because okay. it's not a SQL yeah. command, but you're right. Basically, um, the SQL command is passed in as a string. Okay, um, one thing I'll show so, in a second. So and what, why do we use those like three quotes, the three um, quotes? Oh, okay. the like this guy? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that's actually, you know, it's funny. I, I, last group did the same thing. I realized you guys probably haven't seen it. Um, it's actually important. This is more of a Python thing. If I do three quotes like this, it could be mm -hmm. single quotes or double quotes. This allows me to create a multi-line string. So for example, um, if I wanted to put in like A equals, let's say a string like, um, like that, that's my string and I can do print A, right? And it'll just print out A like this. Um, I also could have, you know, done something like a space like this and I have a space. However, if I wanted to put in something like a new line like this, like it's like, oh, I want it to be the next line. I want to say ASD and then SD underneath. You'll notice that Python says, whoa, I can't do that. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, and you basically would have to do instead, oops, um, sorry, lost you guys for a second. I would instead have to do like something like that where it's like, okay, this is a new line and you can see there's a new line in there, right there. So. Uh, triple quotes allows us to actually put in new lines. So if I do one, two, three, and it fills it out for me, I can actually do triple lines. So I can do ASD, and then I'll do like SD. And this will actually keep those new line characters for me. So this is just one way you can like create these new line characters without worrying about it. Another thing you could do, which I actually don't know if Python, this version of Python will support it. Sometimes you can do this. Nope. Okay. That won't work. So sometimes you can actually put parentheses, or parentheses around it. We'll let it know, like, hey, this is supposed to be together. But I think in Python, um, this version, you have to, you won't understand multi-line. You have to, if you want multi-line, you can put three quotes. You can also put in, um, like I said, it doesn't have to be three single quotes. It could be three yeah. double quotes like that. Cool. Thanks. That's really helpful. No, no problem. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up too. So I'm sure some people don't know that too. Um, so anyway. So anyway, SQL commands are passed in through strings, all right? So I have this guy, I have my fetch all, right? You can see my different um, planet, or my different tables. I can now go ahead and do executions onto that. Um, like I can do certain SQL commands with that table. So for example, there's always a, a select and a from. So I'm selecting in this case, a specific row, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say row, specific column um, name, right? So I'm saying, okay, go ahead and get me only the values within this column. So in the planets table, get me just the names. Okay, so I run this right now and you see Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and so on. Okay, um, I could also do something like uh, I can do multiple uh, columns. So for example, I could do plot planets.name, planets, um, what was one of them? Let's say uh, color, right? So I can say, okay, get me the name and also get me the color for the planets table. And you can see here, I get Mercury, gray, Venus, yellow, and so on. Okay, so you get multiple parts in here. All right, now let's say you're like, you know what? I don't wanna care about the specific columns. I just want everything, all the data you have in that table. So in this case, we can do something like this where we have select and then that little star right here. This is a wild card basically saying, all right, I don't care, just give, give it everything. So you can think of it if I format it in this way, it'd be select star, basically get everything from the table exoplanets, okay? So this should give me the full data. And so you can see the ID, the name, the color, and so on. And that's the way we can very quickly get all the information. Um, this will be useful when we do aggregations, for example. But just know that that's what that is. It's a wild card. Okay. Any questions so far on this stuff? Okay. Just know that um, for SQL, it's always a select. Um, basically, what do you want from what do you want returned, and then from where, from what table? Okay. Uh, one quick question. Yeah. The results that it shows you will always be a list of tuples. Yes, it should always be a list of tuples. Okay. okay. So for example, um, I'm trying to think if I can give something like, like this, let's say, I don't think, yeah, it's not gonna give me, I'm trying to think if there was like no, if there's no results, it will just give the empty list of an empty tuple. Okay. Okay. 
Um, you can go ahead and play around with that a little bit. So, okay, cool. So, cool. Wild card, awesome. And so, one thing you want to say, well, okay, this is nice, but I don't know, like, I don't know what this is supposed to be. If you look at that, right? Like, I see this is supposed to be ID and name, but if you were someone who just got the database, I'm like, I don't know what this floor is supposed to represent. Like, it could be anything, right? So, what we can do um, is actually get the the rows and the curriculum actually shows this part right here, which can be kind of confusing to be quite honest. But basically, it's a list comprehension. So, have we seen this list comprehensions now already? More or less, you guys probably come across it. Um, just know, like, basically, it's a for loop. So, I'm just going to quickly write what this looks like. So, for description and cur dot description um, description oops zero. And I'll do something like this, like um, all equals this. Oops, that's not a good one. I'm still not used to this keyboard. Okay, so essentially this right here, you'll see like I set a new all list, empty list, and then for each description in current dis current description, which I'm just going to give you a hint right now, it's basically just a list of tuples. Okay, so in that list of tuples. Um, give me the description, give me the first elements in that description and append it to this list. That's what this is doing. But it's a quick way so I don't have to write this. You can see how long this took. List comprehensions allow me to just write it all. So you can see there's the for loop, for description and current description. Get just this thing and save it into a list. That's what those brackets are for. Okay, and then I'm just going to print it out. So you can see, if I do this now, you can see I get the column names, ID, name, color, ah, number of moons. That's what that four and one represent. Okay. Um, if I just want to prove it to you, like, no, I'm not, I'm not pulling your leg. It is the same thing. You can see it comes out the same thing. Okay. So again, this is a list comprehension. Just know that this curved out description is probably the hardest part. It's like, wait, what is this? And that's specific SQL like three. All right. All right. So kind of using this, and like, well, this is a pain. Like, I don't know about you guys, but like, I don't want to type this out every single time, right? This is just kind of annoying. So we can actually create a function. So for example, I'm just going to go ahead and use a function called SQL with columns. I get the query, which is going to basically, when I say query, it means like the SQL command, right? And I have the cursor. I'm saying, all right, give me the cursor. In this case, I have a default value. You don't have to put that in there. Basically, I give a query, the cursor, and say, all right, go ahead and perform it, and it will give me the full result. So um, you can look at that a little more carefully as you go through it. But now if I have the SQL command, select star from exoplanet, it's just like we had right here, okay? I can actually use that, and it will give me a, uh, a list, which includes this beautiful description right here. Okay, all the columns. So this way I can quickly do it all at once. So this way it allows you to adjust things how you want it. If you're doing things over and over again, I can just create a function that makes it nice and easy. Okay. Um, again, I'll let you look over this. It's just Python in this case. Um, but you can see like how that, if I'm doing the same thing over and over again, I can just make a function for it. Okay. So I do have a few more minutes. So I want to make sure I go through this. But any questions on um, anything I've gone through so far? Okay, just quite a quick check. Thumbs up, thumbs down, sideways on how you're feeling with stuff right now. And it's okay if you're doing sideways. All right, cool. And I like to say too, it's like, you know, if you're ever sideways like this, that's actually a good place to be because I'm teaching you some new stuff. So it should never feel like uh, you don't understand it, right? Or it shouldn't feel bad for not understanding it. Okay, so I'll go with a little more exploration. So in this case, like I showed, you can do multiple uh, rows, right? I have name, color, number of moons from exoplanets. So you'll see here, I actually save it as a SQL command. I'm saving that string. So if I run this now, right? And if I go ahead and do like a print, oops, uh, SQL command. Okay, you can see this is a string. That's all I'm doing right here. So I'm saving this for later. And then what I can do is like, okay, I got the string all saved up. I can just go ahead and pass the string in with my uh, handy dandy function, right? And I can go ahead and display the results. And you can see, oh, cool. I have the column name. It's like, ah, well, number of moons. It's kind of diagonal, right? It's not the best, not the best thing in the way right now. It's like it only it would be really nice if I could have a data frame, right? So turns out we can. So that's the whole point I'm kind of getting to. So we can actually create a data frame and we can do um, the first way we can do it, like I said, is with list comprehensions, which uh, like you can see, like look at this code. Like just not even look at it. You're just like, oh man, this is a lot to kind of process through. I'm basically doing the execution of the SQL command, getting the fetch all, then with the results. And basically, this is what I think the um, curriculum shows: results, which is going to be the data itself, and they get the basically just the columns, the description, this list comprehension. And at the end of the day, I still get my data frame, which is nice and pretty, right? 
but and it just took a lot of time, right? And you can imagine if I'm doing this for every single data table or subtable I want, take a long time. So what I can do is instead make this nice little, we had a nice little function here, SQL with columns, get my SQL command, get my results, and I can do data frame, column results. It's the very first, the very first result, right? Is that list of, um, the list of, uh, uh, sorry, the first element is a tuple of the different columns. So that's what this is right here. And then say, all right, the rest of the data, it's just gonna be the results, everything after that point. So from one onward, okay? So this is just more Python. So it's a little neater and I get the same exact results. So again, you could even put this probably in like a whole nother uh, function if you wanted to, like say, SQL, like get SQL for uh, data frame or something like that. And you could return a data frame instead. So again, another way you can kind of do things, right? Um, hopefully that is not too confusing with making your data frame pretty good on that, right? Uh, good. This is probably more practice with Pandas. Uh, just know that it's something you can do. Okay. So um, again, uh, last couple things. I'm not going to go into full detail. There's a lot. Like I'm going to make it really clear. There's a lot more detail in the curriculum, obviously, because we can do a lot more within an hour um, by reading it kind of stuff. So just know there's a lot of options. But um, just know that aggregations and filtering. Basically, when you ever you call SQL, you can actually say, "Hey, I don't want to do this on my computer. I want you to do it, server." That's kind of like what we're doing. So for example, let's say we wanted to, um, I said aggregate the moons, basically count how many, how many planets have so many moons. So for example, if a planet, how many planets have two moons? How many planets have one moon? How many planets have like no moons, right? And so I want, I could get the whole data set and then filter in with pandas, which is perfectly fine. But if I had a very, very large data set and I have to get this whole data and then take this whole data and then process it through, it's, it might take a long time for my little small little computer. But if I have the server who maybe the server is a little more efficient in this way, I can get the server to do it with SQL. So what I have here, this is the pandas way. So I select all the information, get the planets. I could have maybe put in like just the moons and the name, but I'm just getting all the data, right? I get the results, get the data frame, and I can see when I run this right now, I get all the information in that data frame. I use the moons aggregate. I can say, okay, go ahead and say the number of moons for value counts. These are just more pandas stuff. Um, so I won't go into detail for it. And say, okay, this is right here saying, okay, this is two moons. There's two planets with two moons. There are, I'm sorry, uh, there's, yeah, there's two planets with two moons. There's two planets with no moons. There's one planet with 14 moons. There's one planet with 62 moons and all that stuff, okay? So again, this kind of gives you an idea of like, how this would work. Um, but you see, you, know, you, you could maybe make this a little neater, but the point is like you could do it with pandas, right? Just like we said before. Now we can do the SQL way. And so you notice that SQL is gonna be a little more complicated. I can say number of moons, I can do something called aggregation, which is a count. And I'll do a count star, which basically say count all of the elements, which is gonna be how many moons there are, okay? Or how many planets with that many moons. And I'll say as planets count. So I can do this as part, basically renaming instead of having like, you can see like ID name, I can actually rename it say, hey, call this planets count. Otherwise, this would have been some other value. So just know that's what I'm doing right here. I say it from the planets, and I have this special command now called group by. So note that your thing will always start with select from, and then I like to say the extra stuff is underneath here. So in this case, the extra stuff, group by, and again, curriculum goes through much more detail, so just be aware of that. I'm gonna group it by number of moons. So basically, it's gonna say, all right, it's gonna group and say how um, all the ones that are, you know, have no moons, all the ones that have two moons, all the ones that have 14 moons, group them together and then count how many there are in there. So you actually see now, I'll get the same value, but in this case you can see I get, um, what's it called? Two planets with no moons, one planet with no moons. I guess I should have swapped this around so it would have been a little easier to read. There we go. So there's two planets with zero moons, one planet with one moon, two planets with two moons and so on, okay? So you can see that's the same a concept that I've done with Pandas, I could do it with SQL. Um, and then I know we're at a little almost time, but I'll just show you this last one, is I could do something similar with filtering colors. So for example, I just want just the ones with the color, what did I do in this case? The color blue. So I get the full data set, you know, I can see all this part. You can see, oh, I want anyone that has blue. So blue, light blue, dark blue, I want these planets. So I could do this with Pandas saying only blue planets. I do this mask right here to filter it through. So this is say, hey, the string, does it contain blue? right? I get that from the data frame. I basically do this fun funky stuff with pandas, basically saying with the dot lock, basically saying like, all right, get all of the rows, um, but get only the columns name and color. Okay. And so when I do this now, I actually get everything that's blue with the name and color. Okay. 
Now, the SQL way I could have done this is say select the name, the color from the table planets, and then lower. Um, this probably wasn't needed, but basically this makes everything lowercase. I, in this case, I wouldn't really need it. So I'll just take this off just to show it's not needed. Okay. But just know it's like, okay, get the planet color. And if it's like, like is kind of like contains, like is there something in here? The word blue. And you'll notice that I'll put these parentheses. That just means saying, all right, don't care about if there's extra stuff like dark blue, light blue, blues, or something like that. Just want the word blue, right? And you can do this full thing right here. I do my normal data frame. So all the meat, instead of being in the data frame, is now in the SQL command. And that basically, whenever it's in the SQL command, it means that the server's doing it. And you'll see I'll get the same exact result. Okay. Cool. So that's another, you know, I'm just kind of showing you two different ways. Again, it just comes down to how you can do it with pandas, or you can make it do with SQL, which is for the server. Okay. Um, so any questions? Um, that kind of, I know I'm a little over. I feel like I'm always over now, but um, if you guys have any questions, um, okay, cool. Thumbs up, thumbs down, sideways. Okay, cool. And I think a lot of it too, you know, um, obviously you need to practice, you know, some of this stuff might be a little confusing if you're not super comfortable with pandas, which of course, more practice. Practice is always good. Um, and then of course the SQL part, just know that I barely scratched the surface on SQL. Um, again, like I said, you can go like really thick books of SQL. Um, if you really enjoy it, or if you're familiar with SQL, that might be some, a route you go into. Um, note that what's kind of cool, there are, are ways to query pandas. Like you can have your pandas data frame and use SQL to actually uh, essentially use, uh, get the information from pandas. So some people who are really familiar with SQL love doing that because they're really familiar with SQL and they've been doing it for so long. They don't have to worry about um, like dot lock, dot I lock or other you know, different masks and stuff like that. So no, that's an option too. Um, and I think the curriculum mentions about how you could do that. Okay. Well, cool guys. Um, so again, any other last questions? All right, so I'll go ahead and find my little bar. I'll go ahead and stop recording.